People love book recommendations. Let me ask what three books. Oh, you can't just like, you can't just give me three. I mean, like, really? Okay. Three? What uh, seven and a half books you can recommend? <laughs> so you're also the author of Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. You're uh, author of uh, How Emotions Are Made. Okay. So definitely those are the top two recommendations of all the two greatest books of all time. Other than that, are there books that uh, technical, fiction, philosophical that you've enjoyed or you might recommend to others? Yes. <laughs> Actually, you know, every PhD student when they um, when they graduate with their PhD, I give them a set a, like a little library, like a set of books. You know, some of which they've already read, some of which I want them to read, or um, but. Um, I think nonfiction books, I would read, the things I would recommend are The Triple Helix um, by uh, Richard Lewontin. It's a little book mm -hmm. published um, in 2000, which is, um, I think, a really good introduction to complexity and um, population thinking as opposed to essentialism. So this idea, essentialism is this idea that, you know, there's an essence to each person, whether it's a soul or your genes or what have you, as opposed to this idea that you, we have the kind of nature that requires a nurture. We are, a, we are, you are the product of a complex dance between um, an environment, uh, between a set of genes and an environment um, that turns those genes on and off to produce your brain and your body and really who you are at any given moment. It's a good um, title for that. Triple helix. So playing on the double helix where it's yeah. just the biology, it's bigger than the biology. Exactly. Um, it's a wonderful book. I've read it probably six or seven times throughout mm -hmm. the year. He has another book too, which is, it's more, I think scientists would find it, I don't know, I've loved it. It's called Biology as Ideology. And it really is all about, I wouldn't call it one of the best books of all time, but I, I love the book because it really does point out, you know, that sci science as it's currently practiced, I mean, the book was written in 1991, but it actually, I think, still holds, that scientists, science as it's currently practiced has a set of ontological commitments which are somewhat problematic. So the assumptions are limiting. Yeah, so in ways that you, it's, you know, it's like you're a fish in water and you don't, like, okay, right. so, yeah, so here's <laughs> David the- David Foster Wallace yeah, stuff. Well, yeah, well, but, you know, but here's a, here's a really cool thing I just learned yeah. recently. Is it okay to, to 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 go off on this tangent for a minute? Yeah, yeah. Let's go tangents. Great. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that I just learned recently that we don't have water receptors on our skin. So how do you know when you're sweating? How do you know when when a raindrop when you know when it's going to rain and you know like a raindrop hits your skin and you can feel that little drop of wetness? Mm. How is it that you feel that drop of wetness when we don't have water receptors in our skin? And I was when I my mind's blown already. Yeah, I, that was my reaction too, right? I was like, <laughs> of course we don't because we evolved in the water. Yeah. Like, why would we need, you know, it just, it was just this like, you know, you have these moments where you're like, oh, of course, there's <laughs> yeah. like a, yeah, so. You'll never see rain the same way again. <laughs> so the answer is it's a, it's a, it's a combination of um, temperature and touch. Yeah. But it's a complex sense that's only computed in your brain. There's no receptor for it. Anyways. Yeah, that's why like s snow versus cold rain versus warm rain all feel different because you're you're trying to infer stuff from the temperature and the size of the droplets. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's your brain is a prediction machine. It's yeah. using lots and lots of information and combining it. You know, anyway, so but um so Biology is ideology is I wouldn't say it's one of the greatest books of all time, but it is a it is a really useful book. There's a book by um, if you're interested in psychology or the mind at all, there's a wonderful book. A little it's a it's a fairly fairly small book called Naming the Mind by Kurt Danzinger, who's a historian of psychology. Everybody in my lab reads both of these books. So they, what what's the book? It's about oh. the origin of the where do where did we get the theory of mind that we have that uh, the human mind is populated by thoughts and feelings and um, perceptions and where did those categories come from because they don't exist in all cultures. Oh, so this isn't that's a cultural construct. 
The idea that you have thoughts and feelings and they're very distinct is definitely a cultural construct. It's another mind blowing thing, just like the rain. Um, so yeah. Kurt Danzinger is a, the opening ch chapter in that book is absolutely mind blowing. I <laughs> love it. I love it. I just think it's fantastic. Um, and I would say that there are many, many popular science books that I could recommend that I think are extremely well written in their own way. You know, before I, I maybe I said this to you, but before I undertook writing How Emotions Are Made, um, I read, I don't know, somewhere on the order of 50 or 60 uh, popular science books to try to figure out how to write a popular science book because mm -hmm. while there are many books about writing, Stephen King has a great book on about writing. on writing and, um, you know, where he gives tips um, interlaced with his own personal history. Um, that was where I learned you write for a specific person. You have a specific mm -hmm. person in mind. And that's, for me, that person is, my, is Dan. That's fascinating. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation to have, like, which popular science books, like what you learn from that uh, search. Yeah. Because there, there's, uh, I have some, for me, some popular science books, are like, I just roll my eyes, like, this is too, um, it's the same with TED Talks. Like, some of them go too much into the flowery and don't, I don't, I would say, don't give enough respect to the intelligence of the reader. Uh, and, uh, but that's, this is my own bias, very I, specific. I, I completely agree with you. And in fact, I have a colleague, his name is, um, Van Yang, who, you know, he um, produced um, a cinematic lecture of how emotions are made that we wrote together with Joseph Fridman. Mm -hmm. No relation. Yes. Um, well, we're all related. Uh, well, I mean, something. you and I are probably, you know, yeah. have some, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I remember um, it's the memories are in there somewhere. It's, uh, yeah. It's from many, many, many generations ago. Um, well, half my family is Russian. So from the good half. The good half, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, he, one, his goal actually is to produce, um, you know, videos and lectures that are beautiful and educational and that don't, um, don't dumb the material down. Um, and he's really remarkable at it, actually. I mean, just, uh, but again, you know, that's good. That, that requires a bit of a paradigm shift. We could have a whole conversation about the split between entertainment and education in this country and why it is the way it is. But that's, a, <laughs> but that's another conversation. To be continued. But I would say, the, if I were to pick one book that I think is a really good example of good science writing, it would be The Beak of the Finch. Which it won a it won a a Pulitzer Prize a number of years ago, and I'm not I'm the I'm not remembering the author's name. I'm blanking. Um, but the I'm guessing is it uh, is it focusing on birds and the evolution of birds? Actually, there's also the evolution of beauty, which That's, is yeah yeah, which is also a great book. But the, no, the beak of the finch is um it's a it. It has two storylines that are interwoven. One is about Darwin and Darwin's um, e uh, explorations in the Galapagos Island. And then modern day researchers from Princeton who have a research program in the Galapagos looking at Darwin's finches. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a really, first of all, there's top notch science in there and really science like, you know, evolutionary biology that a lot of people don't know. And it's told really, really well. It sounds like there also, there's a narrative in there. There's, it's like storytelling too. Yeah, I think all good popular science books are, are storytelling, for just, you know, but storytelling grounded, constrained by, you know, the evidence. And then I just want to say that there are, for fiction, I'm a really big, fan of love stories just to return us to the um mm -hmm. the topic that we began with and so my some of my favorite uh, love stories are major pettigrew's last stand by helen simonson it's a 
it's a love story about people who you wouldn't expect to fall in love and all the people around them who have to overcome their prejudices. Hmm. And, and um, I love this book. What do you like? Like what makes a good love story? There isn't one thing. You know, there are many different things that make a good love story. But I think in this case, um, you can feel, you, you can feel the journey. You can feel the journey that these characters are on and all the people around them are on this journey too, basically to come to grips with this really unexpected love, really profound love that develops between these two characters who are very unlikely to have fallen in love, but they do. Mm. And it's just, it's very gentle. Another book like that is um, The um, the Storied Life of A.J. Fierke, um, which is also a love story but in this case, it's a love story between um, a little girl and her adopted dad. And the dad is this like real curmudgeon-y, you know, um, guy. Uh, but of course, there's a story there. And um, it's just a beautiful love story. And But it also, it's like everybody in this community falls in love with him because he falls in love with her. And he, you know, she just gets left at his store, his bookstore, he has this failing bookstore. And he discovers that, you know, he feels like inexplicably this need to take care of this little baby. And um, this whole life emerges out of that one decision, which is really beautiful, actually. Um, do you very the, poignant. Do you think the greatest stories have a happy ending? or a heartbreak at the end? That's such a Russian question. It's like it's like Russian tragedies, you know? So I, I would say the answer to that for me, there has to be heartbreak. Yeah, I really don't like heartbreak. I don't like heartbreak. I want there to be a happy ending, or at least a hopeful ending. But the, but you know, like Dr. Shivago, like, <laughs> Or the English patient. Oh my goodness. Like, why? <laughs> oh, it's just, yeah, no. Mm -mm. Well, I don't think there's a better way to end it on a happy note like this. Uh, Lisa, like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you for wasting yet more time with me talking again. Uh, people should definitely get your book. And uh, maybe one day I can't wait to talk to your husband as well. Well, right back at you, Lexi. Ha, 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 ha.